back to our laptop that's getting set up. I don't know what's wrong with it. I can't do that right. Three. Okay. So here's our device over here that we've joined. I'm just going to leave all of our privacy right so that Microsoft gets all my data. It's wonderful. You don't want to change it ever. You just want to give it all. Now you might want to consider changing some of those things in settings, possibly. Yes, sir. It will not. Yes, that is correct. That's a great point. Thank you. So um, Windows 10 Home will not function in a uh, Business Premium Direct sign-in. What Business Premium Direct will do is take a Pro Win 7 and give you Windows 10 Enterprise Licensing, but you have to start from a Pro base for it to get upgraded to the Enterprise Licensing. Or that's an E3, bear with me, but the point is, no, it does not solve for home devices. But I think Paco, for anybody that brought a device and it doesn't work, is giving away surfaces. Am I wrong about that? I'm just kidding. I'm trying to give away one face out there. Dang it. Unfortunate. Um, and so you'll see we're finishing through our, our settings um, for Intune uh, under that initial user setting. But it stopped and waited on the user to say privacy. So if they walked away, right, uh, their, their timer's still ticking. So we got to wait on them to come back and say yes to the privacy thing. And so that's why hardware deployment gets rid of some of this in the enrollment status page. And also you can change that in the actual enrollment. The one that we had there didn't set the privacy stuff. If you look at, um, um, if you look back at our first one that was there in our enrollment page that was sitting there, um, it would have been this one and it didn't have the change the, uh, oh, nope, we had the other, sorry, excuse me. It's the autopilot side, deployment profiles. So we had this deployment profile, but it, it likely did not have um, stuff set for the privacy settings. And it said hide, didn't follow it. Okay, that's on me. Yes. Yeah. Well, at least to set them even in the configuration profile. So as you're going through, eh, let's pass that. But yes, it, when it went through that configuration, one of those would have set that before it ever got to that privacy page <laughs> if you set those in the config profiles. Yeah, yeah, 100%. You've done this before. I love it. Thank you for helping. Um, and then the signed devices, there's no serials assigned to this from the autopilot side, right? So nothing's been through the autopilot um, ingestion. And that was because they didn't have it set to ingest into autopilot. Now, hopefully, we'll get that populated here pretty soon from that. There's a little bit of a delay. Yeah, we'll wait. In fact, I might have screwed myself by syncing already. I don't think you can sync again for 10 minutes, yeah. So if you've already synced the autopilot database, you have a 10-minute delay before you can sync again and ask for it. And so if AAD is now populating and enumerating and you've got a delay and you sync too early, like this guy did, uh, you, you could wind up with having to wait 10 minutes. And I've waited many a 10 minute playing this game. Um, but what we can do, that device is live, so we'll go back to it. And we have Dell Support Assist obviously coming up that was installed. But we'll notice like OneDrive's not signed in, right? There's nothing set up to do that. We're gonna get into some of those configuration profiles here in a bit. Um, it's probably installing Office. I think this was set up with an Office install. Let's get into some of those things while we wait on the autopilot database. So let's look at device configuration. So we're gonna go to devices and windows. And then we're going to go down to configuration profiles. And thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll go in devices, windows, configuration profiles, create profile, select platform, Windows 10, templates. Setting catalogs is another one of those parenthetical previews where Microsoft's starting to put like, you know, pieces all together so you have like a, a, a setting catalog to choose from. The template model is much more segmented. So you have administrative templates, custom, device firmware configuration, device restrictions, domain join, addition upgrade and mode switch, email endpoint protection. Um, and so each one of those would have to be set up as a separate profile because you can only grab one of these. And so whatever it is you're trying to do, um, and if I remember correctly, the OneDrive stuff, so OneDrive settings are in administrative templates. And you could do multiple in here, but you can't change categories is kind of the point, right? You can only assign an administrative template category. Um, and then we'd go into our OneDrive folder, and there's a whole host of settings that we can follow here. 
but one we're wanting to look for is silently move Windows known folders to OneDrive, right? So this is going to say, once I start to apply this configuration profile, take documents, desktop, not downloads, yes, pictures, I think are in the known folders category. Um, and you're gonna say, go ahead and set them up with their, their stuff going to OneDrive. The tenant ID already pre-fills the tenant ID that is that Azure Active Directory tenant ID I pointed to earlier, the GUID for AAD. Um, so you don't have to set that. And then do you wanna show a notification to the users, yes or no? I wanna say yes, just so we can hopefully see it when the policy applies on our, on our hardware-based one. But this is going to do exactly that. It's gonna say, listen, go ahead and move their known folders to their signed in OneDrive. Well, what if they haven't signed into OneDrive? Well, we're gonna silently sign into OneDrive. This is a silently sign in users to OneDrive sync, right? And you're gonna say, sign in, yes. It's basically gonna bring in their primary profile, whatever they signed into Windows with, as the OneDrive profile. So those will match. <laughs> Um, and so it'll sign you into that. So this is exactly, if you're thinking about what do these two settings just do for me, I can make it to where my user space is synced to OneDrive and they're signed into the appropriate OneDrive, not their home one, not their Microsoft Live, not their, nope, just gonna be their Azure Active Directory user that signed into Windows when it bound to Azure Active Directory. Um, so we use that at Iconic to give everyone their redirection and then we use Drop Suite um, or whatever you wanna use, there's hundreds of them, to back that up. Well, now if you're backing that up, you have their user profile backed up and you, you have the ability to restore. And the next device they come in, since you've set the same settings, their desktop comes back, their documents come back, their downloads if you've added it to that list, which I had to do with PowerShell. But um, those, those are things where you can actually start to control that user experience in a, in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah. It's not in there. That's why I said downloads, no. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So. I did downloads because I'm a tool and I really wanted all my downloads and people's downloads, like technicians that, that downloaded this ISO and all that. So it's really cool. I like adding downloads. You can't do it in known folders. Known folders only covers pictures, documents, and desktop. So, um, but there's, a, there's some pretty cool scripts out there that you can do with PowerShell to add to that. And that's what I did. Um, so I would run a PowerShell to additionally add some other redirections. So yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. Yes, sir. It would do the same thing. It's by the user as it's going in that. Ah, you may have a great point. I, no, I've signed in other devices and my stuff comes back. It'll still follow that because it's saying with the primary user. So that's where it's set. But when I go to sign in, oh, shit. No, sorry. I did it with a script. You're right. It is the primary user that they're talking about here, as I recall. Can anybody correct me on that that's used this? I, I apologize. I, I, I may have been handicapping myself by using the script in addition so that next net user that signs in would also have their stuff redirected, right? Because I had a script that was also adding pieces. And so it would have done the same. I think you're, it's a good point. I think it's the primary user's device that gets auto-signed into OneDrive um, and in this model, because it is saying the primary user on the device. So I think your, your question though, maybe we take that up personally, but I did a script as well that so that next net user, the scripts apply to you as a user. So when you sign into that device, even though the device was already assigned to Bob and you sign in as Bill, like a conference room machine, that script was making up for that for me, but I would bet in this model, when you sign in as another user, it does not redirect that second user's stuff. So that's a good point to make. And I would advocate for the script. I don't like the restriction of the known folders part right now. Yeah, they used to call this primary user. I'm wondering, so this is saying, this setting lets you redirect the folders without any user in sync. In later builds, uh, OneDrive, we recommend using the settings to give us prompt users to move Windows. If the known folders does not succeed, users will be prompted. They might have fixed this. Um, it used to be primary user, the assigned user to that as the primary one signing in to Azure AD, but I don't know if they fixed it. I apologize. I don't know. Yeah. So. Um, but there, there, I, I'll share my script down the road, too, because that's that one you can apply, and it does universally solve that um, much more defensibly. Okay, and then the last one was prompt users. So this is what they're saying in their instructions back there. They said, hey, if this isn't working, prompt all users. So if it's not done automatically, it should pop up and let them go through the wizard, right? So that's what this setting does. It says, hey, if you enable this, it'll provide your users who are syncing their OneDrives. We'll see your IT department wants to protect and 
So if the automation fails, this should catch up with, it sets OneDrive to automatically ask when your user pops in, and they then go through the settings and say, yes, I want these main folders redirected. Um, that should be all for this. Okay. Do I want to do anything else while I'm in here? Computer configuration, user configuration. So see, that, that's, that is what makes me believe that. That might be all users now, because it is a computer config. So I, I apologize for not knowing the answer to this one, but um, I wonder if the OneDrive piece is healed now with that being under the user side or the server or device side. Assignments, we're going to assign to, we did that as a device, so we're going to assign to all devices. And so now we're starting to set our GPOs, right? You can either set it to a group, set it to all devices, right? So think of when you're doing your GPO, top of the GPO structure versus, you know, specifically maybe an OU or some kind of a restriction in that way. Um, and what else did Dom set in here? He's got a device restriction. And he is doing block privacy experience, block input personalization. Oh, he really has done some, some restrictions. Ah, just the cloud PCs are included in that. So that's why. Setting some Windows Defender policies here. And this is Cloud PCs. OK. All right, let's check in on our autopilot database. Oh, it's probably not been 10 minutes yet, has it? Yeah, it has. Woohoo. So hopefully, we'll get some devices in here. Yes, sir. What's that? No. No, I think this is a, well, this one wasn't set to go through the autopilot ingestion yet. I had to add some devices to the group, and I guessed. In fact, that's a great point. Ah! Um, that's a great point. I wonder if what the name of this device is. Make sure I actually got the device in here. Desktop Bravo Foxtrot. Let's make sure that's in my database. So, Azure AD, MEM devices, desktop Bravo Foxtrot. Yeah. So, this is that device. I added it to this group that should get ingested into Autopilot if it goes back and relooks at that. Um, if, in fact, if we wanted to, once that's in there, I could even sysprep that device. Um, but yeah, wanted to configure. But yes, it should show up in there. Um, now because of that policy I just set. But if you don't have that, it won't automatically, even if you use enrollment, it won't automatically pre-fill autopilot unless you have it set to convert devices into autopilot or you bring the hashes in, right? And so that's what you'll see. Um, what we noticed at Iconic when I did that, I just did it in mass for all devices because it was a virgin tenant. We built that up with just our devices that were AADJ before autopilot kind of existed in its full stroke. And so we just converted them all in mass. And so what was funny is they'd pop up and go, this one won't use this profile, this one won't use this profile, this one won't use this profile. And we'll, we'll get into that because I'm going to show you assigning autopilot profiles here in a minute. I just have to have autopilot devices first to be able to assign them and, and check that. Um, but it, we just brought them all in, and it would say which ones had my TPM 2.0 assertion. And some of it was just that the, the protocol wasn't set in BIOS correctly. right? So I didn't have a device that didn't support it. It was just set in BIOS incorrectly and for that device. All right. Bear with me. So back to Windows. We've set a couple of con configuration profile, our OneDrive settings. Um, and then compliance policies. Did he do this to, who's this scope to? One group assigned properties. Cloud configured machines, OK. So we're going to set up a compliance policy, Windows 10. Device health. So in the compliance policies, you can set device health requirements. So you can say, hey, listen, for this to be compliant, it needs BitLocker. Right? Um, for this to be compliant, it needs secure boot on. It can't have bad configuration code. 
Require code integrity, same concept. Um, you could set some min-max operating system versions. So like for prior to 1909, uh, there's a lot of things that don't work quite well. Um, so I think 1807 was the first that you could get MIM managed, and then 1909, or maybe it was 1703. 1703, I think, was the first um, device management side. And then, you know, so you could say, hey, this policy should only work if I'm in 2003 or, or you know, or whatever, uh, 20H1 or whatever. So you could set some restrictions on that um, from a compliance perspective of whether it's compliant. Uh, configuration manager, so this would be if you're doing um, the old SCCM, so it's not applicable here. It's not pure cloud. Uh, require a password to unlock mobile devices. That'd be if you're getting down into actual uh, mobile devices. Require encryption of device. This is all talking about... Um, the, the compliance part of this, require TPM, obviously, require any viruses asserted by Windows, uh, require Defender, any malware be enabled. And so this is you saying, if I'm checking this device to see if it's compliant, it needs to have these things. And so you could use those compliance policies to say when you're doing your conditional access for Azure AD, you could say, if it's not compliant, don't let it in. And so you can kind of make a very robust way to protect that by saying it must meet these compliances. Here's the things I care about in the compliances. And then those are going to come into Microsoft Compliance Center. Like eventually as that goes, that's going to be part of that whole, am I CMMC compliant? Yeah, here's the stuff from Microsoft. And, and here's where these things tie in together. But right now I don't, I don't believe they are at this point. So we're going to set up a, just a basic compliance policy. When it's non-compliant, immediately send an email to users, right? You can set a template, say your device isn't compliant. There's not one created here. Um, but you could also retire device, right? And you can set days. So these days are saying, add immediately, mark it non-compliant. Send an email to the user at 15 days, right? So you say, or 30 days or something, whatever. Um, and then retire the device at, uh, at 90 days or something. So you, you, could, you could set things that if you aren't being hard, you know, heavy-handed about the, the compliances, you could have it guide the user through, hey, you're still not compliant. I, I did that at first. It was a nightmare chasing down all the secure boots because secure boot can sometimes mean reinstall. It was a nightmare chasing down some of the TPM stuff early on. Um, but you can automate some of those compliancy things so that you could defend that to an auditor and say, yeah, I don't have to do it. I don't have to check this. It's going to happen. As soon as Sally uninstalls antivirus or Matt doesn't have encryption because he turned it off because he's having a challenge, it starts a day ticking and it starts clicking down. And then at X days, it's going to do this. And at Y days, it's going to do something else. Um, and so you can start setting those in your compliance policies. For now, we won't go so heavy-handed as to say, um, <laughs> you know, retire the device, but we'll go ahead and at least say 30 days. Um, I, am I, I don't even have a template. I have to go make a template. This is one of those on Microsoft where I have no path of escape now, right? Because I, if I don't have a template to pre-select, I can't just make one right here. There's no plus button. So I'd have to go to another tab and, and create that. Um, so I'm not going to send an email. I'm just going to leave it with it's marked, marked it as non-compliant for now. Um, and then you could add excluded groups. So if you have um, devices that you know don't contain data you're, you're sensitive about or, or data that you have, you know, you care about in that way, you could say, I, this one's excluded from that. Why? Because it has, in this group, cannot access this data. And so as a result, I could, you know, so you can craft things that are in and out of scope. So if you are dealing with compliances for clients, you are dealing with like CMMC, those things, and you've defined where your QE is, where your, con your uh, controlled unclassified information is, then you can say, but yeah, but these are outside of that scope and they have no possibility of accessing it. Why? Well, here's the group that says they can't access that data. Here's the, right? so you can start saying, you know, you can actually craft the user experience to the appropriateness of the, of the compliance, if that makes sense. Um, but for now, we won't be excluding any groups. We're just going to let it do its thing and play with it and see what devices come through there eventually. So back to devices, Windows. So we've gone through and made a simple configuration profile for, for OneDrive. Um, we've made a um, compliance policy. And then PowerShell scripts, this would be where if you want something run once at startup that's important to you, you can do a PowerShell script for almost anything there for that initial config. So if it's outside of the templates, if it's outside of the administrative, if it's outside of the other piece that Microsoft's made now for these like kind of guided, um, what they call it, configuration uh, catalog, then you can do that with PowerShell. But just remember, like I said earlier, it's not going to keep rerunning that PowerShell. It's not going to check for elicited change and then change it, and it could fail. So your scripting capabilities will need to be part of that. And then some type of artifact proving, right? So if you run a PowerShell and you might want to, in your compliance, say, here's this, the PowerShell ran, here's where the code is, and this is what the outcome was, here's my artifact, right? And you can show that change has been elicited from that. But these PowerShells don't self-heal, is the point. Um, so I wouldn't use them for installing software. Which brings me to installing my software. So 
Now what I want to do is go do some applications. So on the left, you'll see we've moved from the devices uh, uh, column onto the apps column. Um, and in apps, you'll see that we have Windows, iOS, Mac. Obviously, we're focusing on Windows right now. And we want to add an app. And so when they ask you your app types, you've got quite a few. So you have a Microsoft Store app. You have Microsoft 365 apps. You have Windows 10 for Edge settings. Um, and then you have WebLink, Line of Business apps, and Windows apps. So the line of business apps are going to be probably where a lot of us fall. That's going to be your traditional MSIs, right? So you can use an MSI, or you can use an Intune Mac if it's a Mac side. But um, I want to go change this. So the other side would be this W32 app. And these are in the installation file type Intune Win. There's a, a little executable package you can get from Microsoft that we, we may go through here in a little bit to build these packages. And what they do is they take the contents of the folder the package is in, and then whatever parameters you set for your start. And so in the W32 apps, you can set a batch file to execute the files. that are. So if you have like an executable installer but not a MSI, you could elicit this install through using W32 apps. And then obviously we're going to do a really easy one together. We're going to set up Office 365. So we're going to set up the Microsoft 365 apps. Next, we're going to say install. Office, just to make this easy for you. Uh, and then obviously the Matt Lee delete. Um, and so your productivity suite, it's just, I mean, it's, this is a simple one, right? It's Microsoft Office 365 apps. You're, you're categorizing the category, but it's already pre-selected for you. So this actually doesn't do anything. It just lets you, if you're selecting from a catalog, it says what type it is. Um, you can also show it as a featured app in a company portal. They could click on to install, but since we're going to be applying this across the board, then it's going to install for everyone. Um, and you can put some notes in there. And, the, and they let you use the configuration designer. You can also bring in XML data, like if you're doing a Microsoft ODT, Microsoft Offline Deployment Toolkit. Um, you can use that, or is it online deployment? ODT, whatever. But you can use the XML configurator from that, or you can use their configuration designer. In their configuration designer, it's all GUI, right? So you're just going to say Access Excel, OneNote, Outlook, PowerPoint Publisher, don't need Skype for business, Teams and Word. Um, and then if you had other licenses and you want to install, you can install Project and Visio. Uh, architecture 32 or 64 is selected here. What's the update channel um, of, of, of this? So you can do current channel, which is your preview stuff, monthly enterprise channel, which is your traditional, and then your semi-annuals for the slower change clients. So current channel or current channel preview, let's just do preview. This would remove other MSI versions. So the older style MSI Office, not click to run. So don't get confused. This will only remove other versions like an 07 MSI. It'll pull it. 010, is there 010? 10, 2010. Um, we would remove that version as well, but it's only going to pull the MSIs. But I like to leave that yes, just in case you are wanting to strip any other office associations that would have been local installed on a machine. Um, and then latest or specific version. When you go specific version, you can actually just pick whatever's in the selectability of, of Office for those specific versions. I prefer just staying on the latest version. Um, use shared computer activation comes into play when you're starting to talk to RD Web, uh, WVD, things that might have multi-tenancy in them. And so that's just saying, remember in the old days when you had to use the ODT to deploy a remote desktop office that would function? This is going to deploy the shared use model for computer activation as a default. That's actually already on yes, just when we started up. So this policy is still good just to get that deployed out, and, and it's pretty universal. Microsoft's probably, I hope eventually they just drop that, but. Um, Accept the EULA ahead of time for users. Yes, please. Um, install background service for Microsoft Search and Bing. Like, I can't think of anything I want more than Bing. Um, so we're going to leave that at no. <laughs> uh, and then languages, you could select other, um, other Office versions in language. Uh, fun trick is there's a lot of malware that won't detonate if you have a Cyrillic keyboard. Uh, so there's a lot of Russian-based malware that just won't fire off. Uh, if you happen to have a Cyrillic keyboard installed. So you, you can do that in, in this Intune to, as a defense mechanism too. But Office not specific, it just made me think of it. Um, and so we're going to say assign to all devices. Everybody's going to get Office. Um, and then you could do available. So the difference between these three is assigned for all devices says it's just going to install. As soon as it sees it in its app configuration policy, it's going to go ahead and run that and install it. Um, available means that a user or a device could ask for that out of the portal. Um, and then uninstall is also handy. Right? Because you can, if you're using W32 apps or if you're using MSIs and you're doing these and setting them up, you could conversely set them to uninstall for certain users and groups. Right, So you could make a policy just to uninstall Office. 
or make a policy just to uninstall an application. Right? So policies are not one direction. They can be uninstall or install policies. Um, and you could actually just go flip the bit, if you will, on a policy where you had already installed it and it would then subsequently sometimes uninstall it. <laughs> I'm going to be specific with sometimes because it's not always perfect with Microsoft. But we're going to set this up for install. Um, and we're going to make it required. And we'll save it. The other thing about required is when you think of it, gosh, I just keep killing this camera. But when you think of required, it's going to be that section when we said wait for all apps that are required to be installed before moving forward. That's where these are going to show up, right, is in that required status. And so that's just understand the delineation there from available and required for that. So what else can we install on apps? So let's go ahead and say um, we're going to install a line of business app, but we're not going to use an Intune Win. We're going to use a MSI. The MSI that I've already pre-downloaded is Screen Connect. So we've got that in ConnectWise Control. So what's cool is you'll notice when you do click on this MSI and you bring it in, it's going to say, okay, it's Windows platform. It says that in its MSI package. It's 1.7 megs. It's not MAM capable. So I couldn't use this as a MAM type application. Uh, and it's per machine as an execution. So you know it's not user-based. The MSI asserts that in its MSI information. And so that's all it's grabbing is just based on the MSI what it's capable of. Um, and so we're going to get, so this is Screen Connect with the GUID for my new little demo tenant. Um, you have to put in a publisher name. So even though it could have been embedded, it did, you know, it says Screen Connect. You have to have a publisher name with it. So I'm going to say ConnectWise. Um, and then this is important. So ignore app version. So if you're installing an MSI, and let's say that version is 1.1, right? Um, and so you now have, this app is going to get auto-updated. It's going to be 1.2 this might see that as not 1.1 and try to reinstall it. So if you say ignore app version, um, then you, you would want to say that for apps that are automatically updated by app developer, Screen Connect happens to be one of those that is going to auto-update and get beyond the version you might have stored with the MSI in this. And so if you aren't in a good enough update process to go back and continue updating those MSIs in Intune, then you'd want to set this to yes so that it doesn't try to just uninstall and re-roll over the one that's already got that version, and you just get tons of log entries that says, this is already installed with a newer version. This is already installed with a newer version. This is, and it just eats up resources. Um, so you want to kind of pay attention to that. You can also fill out a lot of information if you're giving these as self-selection things. These are the information context pieces for the app portal to say, hey, this is an approved software. Here's the company we're getting it from. Here's information internally for you know maybe a, a document about what this application's for. Um, who the developer is, all that. You don't have to fill that out uh, to do this part of this. And then we're going to add all devices, and then we get Dom's device with Screen Connect on it. It's going to be awesome. So let's go ahead and say create. And just remember, these are happening. So if you made a group or you did all devices, as soon as I save this, if there's other devices that are going through a sync process or somebody reboots or time goes by and it does another sync in, it's going to start installing those things. And so we would have expect in here in the next 10 or so minutes for any device that is live, which there's a limited set of them, but one of them is my cloud PC, should start having Screen Connect on it as a deployment method. Um, so when, when I made that context, all users, that MSI is going to get installed on any device, including this device, um, through Intune. Now, we can force that. I kind of wanted to build enough apps that we can go force that, but let's, um, let's just look a little bit further because I, I also got one more MSI, I think, that I wanted to do. So back to here. So now in our apps, we have, you know, in we have Office that I set up. Um, we have Screen Connect that I set up. And we have Mozilla, but I think Mozilla is structured to only go to the cloud PCs right now. So um, we'll do one more line of business application, select, select that package file. Uh, and then because I'm going to be using cloud PC, I might want to install the remote desktop client. Right, the, the, the Windows uh, 365 remote desktop client. So I'm going to go ahead and ins ins install this. And so now you'll see the other one was execution context of per device. This MSI happens to be a per user MSI. And so you could actually set this to say, if you're a user that needs WVD because you're in the cloud PC users group, then you'll get the cloud PC users device or uh, 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 the remote desktop app. But if you're not, you won't see that and it won't pester you. Um, so that's something you can use where the same group elicits several things that happen. Right, based on that, but um, this just wanted to show that the execution context is listed when you're looking at adding the MSI, so that you can know what you're what you can actually have happen. Meaning that if I sign in as Bob, I'll see it, but if I sign in as Sally, I won't see it as long as it was user context installed. Um, and it's already set that here, right? So it's already it's grayed that out because it knows that it's a user based. If it had both, you could have some selectivity uh, in that. So I don't know that I've ever seen one with both, but. Uh, 
But yeah, again, back to this ignore app versions. Additionally, if you have an MSI and you're wanting to do certain things, like I want to set it so my users can't change this, or with Sentinel One, for example, I want to set it to go to the right GUID, and I want it to go to, um, you know, I want it to allow Defender to still be active, or I want it to. This is all just the front slash, you know, front slash S, you know, front slash no reboot, whatever those might be for MSI flags. Those go in as command line arguments right after the MSI. So that's what this is. It doesn't, if I re, as I recall, it doesn't require quotes. That it's already assumed that that's being quoted appropriately in the command line install. So anything you type in this box is quote unquote in quotes. <laughs> it's got to use quote like three times, which is awesome. But um, yeah, so th that's what this is for, is for those individual installs. So let's say you have a client and you're installing, uh, you know, Datto uh, RMM or you're doing something like that. This would be where you'd set those client specific variables that need to exist in their Intune so that when a device comes on, it might have your RMM, it might have the tools you want on there um, to the right tenant portals, if that makes sense. So that's where you get your command flags for those type of things. Yep. Oh, thank you. Yeah, it did flag for me. I appreciate you. Uh, publisher is Microsoft, which that data is in the MSI. Like, I, anyways, but why didn't we select it? And then add all devices. What did I just do? It was, is that remote desktop that I was installing right now? Yeah. I probably won't do that. Well. Yeah, why not? Nobody will get mad at me. It's a lab. So Dom Kirby at Pax8 uses this lab too. So I don't want to step all over his toes, but <laughs> I also do. So. so during this, is uploading that file. This is a 21 meg file. Um, if you're uploading a four gig ISO or something, or a four gig, they're not meaning to be four gig MSIs, but if you're uploading a larger one, just remember you do have network delay uh, that can play into it. And so you, you got to sit here and wait on this to finish with Microsoft. And then once it's, once it's done uploading, which I would think 21 meg should have finished pretty quick. So I'm guessing we don't have much upload bandwidth here. There it goes. Okay. So that's in. I wonder if we already have our device in Screen Connect. So now that we've got a couple of applications, what I want to do is try to force it. If Screen Connect's not here, where are we at? There we go. The Screen Connect doesn't start showing devices, which it hasn't. Then I want to go force it. And there's a couple ways we can force it. One is from the device, um, where you would come in here. Oh. One of them is from the, good Lord. I'm into a, a fight there. Um, OK, so we can go into work or school on the device and kind of see a place where we can sync this pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Whoop. Our script. Okay. So we'll access worker school. And info. And sync. So this will start a device side reach out to Intune sync. Uh, the other one in Intune, and I'm not going to do it here. I'm going to do it on the other one. Uh, yeah, this will probably be faster. I'm going to do it here. So this will sync. This will start doing any applications it's missing. It will rerun through all those things to say, am I, am I up to date on policy? Do I have the stuff that I should have? And it should start checking it in. The other place you can do that from is from here in our MEM management side. We can come in and go to devices. MEM. Oh, I fail. All right, whatever. We'll just go to endpoint. Uh, endpoint.microsoft.com. Devices. We will notice that our device, that desktop dash Bravo, because we signed in through the onboarding experience, this one is in Intune, and it says it's managed by Intune. Management name is tuser underscore windows, da 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 da, um, which actually brings me to a good point and opportunity to do this. When you start joining stuff in through Intune, um, we liked to use the management name because it showed up in one of the reports really well as the human. So this would be test user laptop or something, right? And so you could actually have this management name be what shows up in reporting in Intune in the device list there so that you can actually have some like, you know, tie it to a user there. But you also can go in and say change primary user. So if you notice here, my primary user is test user. Why? Because I'm the one that registered it. Right, And so since test user signed in, that's who owns it. If you want to change some of that, there's two places to change it. You have to change it in Intune, but also if you don't change it in autopilot assignment, it won't be assigned to that user at the next time it oobs. So those are two separate databases, again. And I, I'm waiting for some devices to show up in autopilot so I can show it. But 
Um, the, the purpose of saying that is that this is just specifically to Intune and the ownership primary user, and it mainly only affects right now just the, the device and where it shows up in the recording, essentially. Um, the other thing we can do that's kind of cool is we can, and we asked it to rename, didn't we? No, that we hadn't gone through that yet. Okay. Um, in the new policy, it'll rename based on the device template name we gave it. But for now, let's say we have this device that came in, and it's in Intune, and we see it's called desktop dash bravo foxtrot 4100 blah 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 we can come in and go to the dots and go to rename and we can also add the serial number remember how i said earlier it's percent sign serial percent not here here it's it's a bracket bracket serial number cuz microsoft loves to make that fun for us right so this is going to be ict dash bracket bracket uh, serial number serial number it is nice to you about telling you like, hey, your nomenclature's wrong until you fix it. So it, it, does, it does tell you, hey, that's not gonna work. Um, and I could say, go ahead and restart after rename. I don't want to, because I think Office might be trying to install here in a, in a bit, so I don't wanna like break that. Um, just know if you do that and you have other things happening, you can put yourself in a non-recoverable state on some of those until you oob. I've played that football game before and it was mainly with Office. <laughs> so um, I would just say, you know, be careful with the restart after rename, because it's gonna do it pretty instantly. Um, so we're just gonna say rename. Uh, and then it'll tell you pending. Well, if we remember, we asked it to sync, and it should be syncing. It says it was successful. So now we're gonna ask it to sync again here. So we're gonna say from Intune, this device I just referenced and was using to sync from here, I can also sync it from here. I, I found the sync on the local to be more efficacious than this sync. Uh, one of my uh, internal IT guys, uh, Jason Farmer, is the one that pointed that out to me, and that it's just highly effective to do it from here to apply policy, where this might take a little bit longer. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, to be honest with you. But we're gonna ask it to check in. If successful, it'll check in. And you can see we've already got my device model. It grabbed that information in. Um, and I wanna see if we actually have our device, devices starting to show up in, uh, in, in autopilot, because I wanna point out some of those things. So we go Windows. Enrollment, they made this super convenient to get to. Yes, so we sucked in a 7470 serial number. To, this is even better, my assignment failed, great. So we noticed that we had a conversion to X-ray 9 Y Q 72 I'd wager if we go look, that's going to be that serial number uh, since we checked in and now we have a new profile. And if we notice, look, we have associated Intune device, NA, because it hasn't been through Intune and be associated through Autopilot, right? So it, we've already shown this device exists in Intune, but it's not associated. And the reason for that is it didn't go through Autopilot. So that's a handy way to find out if a device has been through Autopilot or not, is to see if it has an associated Intune device. Why does that matter? Well, if you delete the Intune device, you have not deleted the Autopilot device unless they're associated. So that is kind of part of this. So, um, and then it also has a link to its Azure AD device name, thus proving the three databases. So you have an Intune database object, you have an AAD database object, and you have a autopilot database object that I'm in right now from a referential point. So there are three iterances of each of these devices. Clicking on this will take you to the device in the embedded frame in AAD, right? So if you're, if you're looking for one to disable or if you have something, it will take you to the original source of its identity, its GUID, its hardware hash ID, identity in AAD. Um, so it's, I'm happy it failed. Why did it fail? Probably failed because it doesn't have a 2.0. Assignment of device-based Matly delete policy, which is handily named for that, failed. Why? Self-deploying mode requires TPM 2.0 hardware. So I may have screwed myself on this because these might not be TPM 2.0s. So might not be able to do the hardware-based, but we could take it through the other. But the surfaces will all have TPM 2.0s. You'll be able to do that. But the point was, and, and I, it might actually be wrong because once it resets, it may, it may have it. So we'll see here in a bit. But now I should be able to reset this device. So we're going to go into Intune. And since we're gonna be resetting it, we don't care. So we're gonna find it. I want to restart it now, because I don't care anyway, so it should restart. The downside is that restart won't sync right away, so if you do sync, it should make that happen faster for the restart. Boy, I'm really struggling with this camera. There we go. So, because I synced it there, instant, right? I made the command in Intune. Intune's waiting to tell it to restart the next time it hears from it. That next time it hears from it is on a cadence. But what I've done is just said, no, check me in now. I wanna, I wanna ask. And as soon as I checked in, it said, hey, you're on the 
um, you know, shut down space front slash R, um, not the hasty one. So that this would be the X number of minutes before you're signed out and it's rebooted. Uh, in the same fashion, in the top here, if you come back to control one, you have a couple of options up top. You have wipe, retire, delete. Um, and in the retire side is if I'm wanting to pull something out of commission, I want it to be stripped of its data access, I don't want it to be able to be able to access Act Azure Active Directory anymore, that's what retire is going to do. Um, when you do that, the user that's sitting there will still have Emily at whatever as the sign-in, but when I go to sign in, it'll say your password's wrong. It's really frustrating um, because you don't realize that you've removed the association with AAD, so you can't sign in. And it's telling the user their password's wrong when in reality it's 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 a device that's been disabled. It's been removed from Azure Active Directory. It can't sign in with that user anymore. And so it gives you some really bad output that causes a user challenge when you're trying to troubleshoot problems sometimes. Um, delete, similar. It's going to do the same thing. Wipe is going to wipe that device and, and start it again. And then you also have fresh start and autopilot reset. There is a giant article to describe which does what. And, and, and all of that, Microsoft's given themselves no favors here because it's, it's really tough to know when to use what. Fresh Start is going to, if I remember correctly, clear out the device and start it as if it's just going back through. Autopilot Reset is going to upgrade, and I might be getting these mixed up. Please go read the article. It's fairly long and, and brought in. I, I can get you guys some links to it. But Autopilot Reset is going to bring it up to the latest version of OS. I think that's Fresh Start. Fresh Start, latest version of OS, and then wipe and restart again, maintaining user data. Whereas autopilot reset, I think, is the full reset. So let me let me find this real quick. Just um, autopilot reset versus wipe versus fresh start. Uh, and there's a fairly deep article about that. Yeah, I think this is the one. Um, they'll break through and really read through which ones do what uh, and when you would want to use them. So I, I would caution you to read it. I don't want to sit here and read this to you. But we want the one maintains region language keyboard and provisioning packages and Wi-Fi. Reset is the best for reusing a device within your organization. Um, and then fresh start is nearly identical to wipe, but restore a device back to its factory settings back to OO. With one difference, fresh start will also remove OEM preloaded applications, which it doesn't always do perfectly. Delete is identical to retire. Uh, it, so anyways, really good read. Uh, go through and read through this because it'll help you understand what's best for you. I believe what I want, though, is the complete reset. Factory settings is used for lost or stolen devices. Data cannot be restored. But you can do a wipe and retain user status. So, um, yeah, okay, so we want wipe. So when you say wipe, factory reset returns the device to, to its default settings. This removes all personal company data. data. Wipe device but keep enrollment state and associated user account. Um, or wipe device and continue to wipe even if device loses power. Uh, you can see why that might have some challenges uh, since it's doing a, a background operation. So now we're down to Windows. We'll shut down in two minutes on this other uh, screen here. So just uh, we're, we're being signed out slowly. So <laughs> remember the sign out's not fast. <laughs> so. Uh, now it's telling me that at 46 after and 59 seconds, it's going to finally sign my user out um, after I asked it to about three minutes ago, so give or take. But at the same time, when that device comes back up, I want it to have a wipe device waiting on it um, and have it have no user state since I already have its hash captured, right? So it's in the autopilot database, so it should be associated. I'm going to go ahead and wipe that device, which won't happen probably before the reboot, right? Because the reboot should start. What's nice, though, is the reboot should contact Azure, and when it contacts Azure, the Intune policy should be applied. And this wipe then should be honored, and it should go through another reboot cycle. So that's what we're hoping is going to happen here. While we're waiting on that, though, we're going to build another autopilot template for the user-driven autopilot enrollment. Uh, oh, that already applies to all devices. So I think I can fix this. Let me. I'm, I don't have a TPM 2.0, and I don't. I don't believe. I might be wrong. Yes. Oh, you totally could. Yeah, I was kind of wanting to illustrate how horrible it is to. You know, <laughs> reboot my computer. Um, yeah, yeah. So and it, and you'll notice we do actually have a device in um, here, and it is that device uh, that's over here. That's about the reboot through the the Intune uh, side. Of course, now right as I get my my screen connect up, it's like rebooted. Black black device, nothing here. Um, but anyways, so this is showing that those policies are starting to apply right as we synced in. 
why have the other cloud PCs not done that? Because they're not on their sync schedule yet, right? Now, I could go back, however, in devices, select all devices, select everything. Let's just do mine, since that way it's me. Ask it to sync. And upon that sync, since I don't have an exclusion set, Screen Connect should install. So I should get pretty quick. And that's one of the quick ones. If you wanted to do a fast deployment of Screen Connect, like it's fantastic. Now, I will say Microsoft had used to use um, TeamViewer. They are building in Remote Assist into Intune. So I think that's public knowledge. It might not be yet. But they are going to be building Remote Assist into Intune so that you just have direct access through Intune, through your identity, through your access, uh, without having a Screen Connect product. And so you're reducing that supply chain risk by removing more I mean, you're putting them all in the same basket but they're already kind of there anyway, right? So, uh, you know, you're reducing additional software that you might have to install. It's now just part of Windows Remote Assist, and, and it's just being built directly into the Intune product. So you click the device, the user, sign in, and I'm in. Um, and so uh, I don't know when that's coming to release, but it's coming. And so we actually notice, um, if we switch back to our camera here, and anybody that's close enough to see it, um, we're resetting the PC. So it did connect to Azure on its reboot and get its reset, even though it was already in a reboot cycle. It's now getting reset because it happened to have checked in on that sync when I sent it a sync. So this will come back to an oop state. It'll come back to potentially going through the hardware setup. If I'm fast enough, I can get it assigned to a profile. The challenge is in order to do the hardware-based enrollment, you have to have a TPM 2.0. So it's, I'm going to have to put in a user credential on this one, I believe, unless, I'm, unless this is just read it wrong. But um, assignment failed means that it's not going to use device-based enrollment, unfortunately. Between 2 p.m. Even though we wiped this, you'll notice the Azure AD object that's associated with this is still a valid object, right? So I wiped the machine. Hmm? Oh, golly. Bear with me. Uh, so we, we reset this device. So the device state as Intune understands it, the Intune object is being reset. Does that make sense? So this is the Intune object in the database that's being reset, being deleted from there, doesn't exist going away, but object still exists in Windows autopilot section and has no associated Intune device, but has an associated Azure AD object. And so this is kind of back to that disconnected databases challenge, right? Um, in the sense that I wipe the device as Intune understands it, the hash of that device is still the same. And when it's represented to autopilot, it will be still that device and be brought in if a profile is assigned. Right now I don't have a profile assigned because it's saying it doesn't have a TPM. That can be one of two reasons. It didn't have a TPM asserted because it didn't go through autopilot, so you don't have that one showing up as having a, a TPM. Or it could be, what I'm getting at is, after this reset, we'll find out if I have a TPM 2.0. Because if I do, when it goes through, it'll see the hash and it'll assign it to the appropriate profile. Right now, it's making some assumptions about that TPM, if that makes sense. And this is my anecdotal uh, understanding, so understand this is just me working through a few hundred of these, uh, but not the actual Microsoft's written it out for me that clean. So. A little bit of assumption being made, but we will find out in a moment. I would expect we have some other Screen Connect stuff now. Lost my mouse. There you are. Not yet. Okay. Um, what else? Let's get back to our device is resetting. I want to show grabbing a hash. So I'm going to change to the other laptop real quick. It's in a noob state as well. Uh, over here, if we want to take like a five minute break. Everybody hit the restroom and uh, or whatever, and uh, we'll come back at it. But I'm going to switch laptops so I can show you how to grab a hardware ID hash to bring into autopilot. Yes, sir. 